Namaste, and welcome to our continuing series on homeopathy with our beloved Dr. Pachagavkar. Today we are going to continue with the composition of the body, and we will have two parts on the digestive system. So this is part one, digestive system. In digestive system, it's very interesting that it comprises of a long gut, what we call rather um, intestinal tract, gastrointestinal tract, what we call. It's a, it's a long, hollow gut. Plus, we have uh, liver and pancreas as allied organs, which are connected with the digestive system. It, it starts with mouth as an opening and then rectum as end, the anal end, rectum. And, and food passes through series of actions in this gut and it goes on, it's a chain. For example, if you just take a bite in mouth, the salivary glands are in action and saliva is secreted and there the, the processing starts. So especially the carbohydrates and all the, the enzymes are released where, where the carbohydrates start getting digested right in our mouth. So food is churned, uh, deglutination what we call in mouth and it mixes thoroughly with the saliva and then it becomes very smooth to descend. So this process starts in mouth and depending upon the consistency of the material what we are eating, the saliva is secreted and that so everything becomes almost a liquid. And then once that mixing is thorough, then our mouth will push by with the help of tongue food in our esophageal tract. It's very well organized and well synchronized. In the sense, we have one apparatus called what we call epiglottis. Epiglottis is a thing which seals the trachea because we are constantly breathing even while eating we are breathing so just when at the verge of uh, swallowing the epiglottis seals the tracheal opening so that food doesn't enter into our windpipe and then food bolus descends in esophagus and then the epiglottis releases trachea so the breathing and eating, it is well synchronized and nowhere there is a chance that it would go in wrong way. That air going into esophagus or, or food going into trachea, that doesn't happen. So it's well organized. So tongue is pushing, epiglottis is organized to seal the trachea and then the food is pushed in esophagus. And esophagus also... So the whole gut is made up of circular and longitudinal muscle fibers which contract and relax in such a way that it gives what we call a peristaltic moment where, where the suppose food is lodged in one area so proximal area constricts and then food is pushed to the distal area so this way it descends up to stomach and at the end of esophagus. It is sort of a sphincter, sphincter where muscles relax if something is coming from the esophagus for entry into stomach but at the same time it is like a non-returning valve. Contents of the stomach are not allowed to have reflux in, in healthy state. There are conditions where this sphincter becomes inefficient and then we get what we call retrograde acid, reflux, acid, acid reflux. reflux. Yes. So actually it is not hyperacidity, it is a misnomer. Oh. It is the acid content of the stomach which, which get entry into esophagus, that is acid reflux. So this esophageal sphincter, that there is a junction, it is hardly, you can't distinguish where the esophagus ends and where the stomach ends. So this sphincter actually controls it is just one way entry even if you keep the person inverted and the person is eating so against gravity with the peristaltic moment the food will be pushed to stomach it's a wonderful mechanism mm. 
of course there are certain conditions where where the functioning if it is not normal it makes the situation very pathetic we have seen some cases where if this peristaltic movements are not proper the circular muscle fibers and longitudinal muscle fibers they go into spasm and the moment person starts eating or some food starts descending it goes in constriction and food is not allowed to pass further what we call the the medical term for this is achalasia cardia achalasia cardia is a condition where this esophageal muscle fibers are not synchronized properly and they go in spasm as soon as any food enters and then they just constrict so that nothing is allowed to enter even for hours together food may get lost in and it's a very pathetic situation hmm definitely it's a functional disorder like that there is no deformity in the muscles it is only the problem is in control of the muscles so it is like that's why we call it functional disorder and uh, but in normal course absolutely there is no issue food passes further and once stomach is full both the ends and when we are eating while eating we eat till our stomach is satiated what we call you know the full quota of appetite is there and then we you start stop relishing the food or you stop eating and once it is there the food remains in stomach for churning and in stomach also there are so many activities going on and one major activity in stomach is mixing with the acid the acid secretion in the stomach is so much that the ph is up to 2 that much acidic the contents are because it b- further breaks down see the digestion starts in mouth itself especially carbohydrates with saliva they start breaking down in the mouth itself and as the food enters stomach there also the food gets again what we call processed with the help of this acid the breaking down starts and especially what we call proteins they get coagulated like milk milk as soon as it enters stomach it no more remains milk it becomes curd within within minutes mm. and with the action of this acid there occurs lot of churning and that too our system has wonderful sensors that how long this churning has to go is sensed and judged by our system through the branches of vagus and nerves in the stomach for example if if one happens to eat lot of fried food fat food the churning may continue even for few hours like 2 hours 3 hours up to 4 hours also the content will be going on churning and the the food will be processed in stomach itself till that breaking down is perfect sometimes if you are eating light food which is just carbohydrates and not oily and not much proteinous then maybe the stomach churning would be be enough if it is just 30 minutes or 45 minutes mm. so even that what we call very intelligent system it is to to decide and you can't imagine the muscles of the stomach we have seen during dissection like how our biceps and triceps are strong that much strong are these uh, stomach muscles so that the food churns wonderfully well in in stomach for hours together and it's quite an exertion that's what we say that when you are full stomach your your stomach is uh, churning the food that time you should not take up swimming or even you should not sleep with with stomach churning with the food the reason is like suppose one is asleep during sleep what happens the the whole musculoskeletal or autonomous system or voluntary muscular system goes in hibernation so the minimum life activities are there everything is in hibernation but the stomach is in in hyper function mm. because of churning and therefore the quality of sleep also actually gets hampered because of that that's what we say that when you eat means it is a heavy work digestion is a heavy work for at least few minutes or few hours 
and therefore once it is complete then the pyloric end which is which is the distal end of stomach that opens and then allows food to pass through small intestine and the the first part small intestine is in three parts one is duodenum which is a shorter one then is jejunum which is the longest one and the terminal part is ileum so this duodenum there the pancreatic juice and the bile from liver it come they these juices come and and mix with the food which is already almost half digested and churned and mixed thoroughly from the stomach and there the the digestion of uh, proteins fat and carbohydrate occurs the bile especially which is uh, released by liver that that is released and stored in our gall bladder and that when you eat depending upon what you eat or how much fat food you have consumed the bile secretion will be there bile if you have seen it is green in color and pancreatic juices they also come and and mix in duodenum and there the digestion starts carbohydrates proteins and fats mostly and it is a finer finer digestion starts from duodenum and when it is mixed again there then it is being processed then it passes further almost on an average our small intestinal tract is uh, 10 meters 10 meters long oh. and that much you know it's it's all coiled up and the food has to pass further and the system is so intelligent that you know as the food is processed the things are being absorbed in small intestines as well as the things are allowed to pass further not only that it's a wonderful fine processing in our small intestine where the friendly organisms the bacterial organisms friendly organisms that whole flora in the small intestine it starts releasing you know uh, chemicals which which help in breaking down the system not only that like for example uh, vitamin b b group those vitamins are synthesized in our intestinal tract with the help of these friendly organisms that's what we call probiotic probiotic means which will yes. enhance the growth or multiplication of these friendly organisms so with this help of these friendly organisms our digestion takes place in small intestines and again with the same peristaltic movements it starts advancing further and slowly 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 it the things get absorbed and what is undue which is not useful that is allowed to pass further so all the essential ingredients or nutrients from this food are absorbed by the intestine small intestines by processing it finely with the help of friendly organisms and again the process continues and once it is about to get completed by the time it reaches the cecum what we call ileocecal junction cecum is the junction of small intestine and large intestine mm. till then the whole process is complete the water is absorbed uh, the fluid is absorbed the nutrients carbohydrates fat protein everything is absorbed and and inserted to the in the blood stream so that it is carried to the storage or utilization like that and once the complete process is over and food whatever remains in the form of it is not exactly the excreta at this stage but it is just unwanted food particles are allowed to pass further in that some tissue cast or unwanted even products of the process they are also are allowed to flow with the intestinal peristaltic movements and once they reach the cecum or or the junction of the large intestine and there the process of what we call stool formation starts mm. there the the moisture or extra water is absorbed by the body 
and there the the stool formation occurs in large intestine and then again it is like an ascending colon then transverse colon where where it is a transverse and then the descending colon and finally it comes to rectum and rectum where where the fecal matter which is which is the excreta to be thrown out that is stored and once enough quota is stored and it is actually logistically possible like wc around and all we get the urging sensation and the person evacuates it so it's it's very interesting to learn that how food enters in mouth and in in the say process of say 24 hours it reaches the rectum which is outlet and this way all undue processes even if you suppose you ingest some foreign body the intelligent system in our body recognizes it and then it is allowed to pass further without you getting any harm from it and even the foreign bodies are allowed to negotiate through it so it's a wonderful thing to experience i have only one question on this subject and that is when someone says oh it went down the wrong windpipe the food so what has happened there to cause that see it is this what i i said epiglottis epiglottis, epiglottis yes. is it closes off that windpipe yes pipe yes area. it should be so synchronized that the moment our mouth feels that you know the food deglutination is enough we have chewed the food properly mm -hmm. it is mixed properly and now it is ready to be pushed to esophageal area that time the tongue pushes and it is a wonderful reflex that reflex is such that the tongue is pushing it the epiglottis seals the trachea sometimes what happens sometimes this epiglottis action becomes what we call uh, irregular erratic or uh, under oh. some confusion under some stress it it doesn't seal the windpipe and when it doesn't seal the windpipe particles are pushed in tracheal this thing and immediately trachea also has ciliary you know tissues so immediately foreign body body you know rejects it and and then <clears throat> in the form of spasmodic cough or something it is mm -hmm. thrown out again in the mouth yes so this happens gagging only it is sort of a um, improper synchronized functioning of epiglottis which can cause it can happen even without like uh, someone empty swallowing during night if someone is sleeping and and one has a post nasal drip and post nasal drip and if if it is not properly you know organized the ciliary this thing then it may go again in windpipe and person mm. may develop this sort of a gagging but it happens otherwise there is no chance that body can do it wonderfully a whole day person would be breathing but eating and the breathing will continue and there would be no wrong entry of food thank you sir